Hello, today we are going to look at common emitter amplifiers. Yay! We're going to look at three things on the common emitter amplifier, the basic configuration. First one, voltage gain, amplification factor. Second one, the input impedance. In other words, what does this amplifier present as a load to some driving source, like a microphone, for example. And thirdly, it's output impedance. In other words, what does the load see as far as the impedance that drives it? All right. Now, there are many ways that we can bias this particular circuit. Um, for no particular reason, I'm going to use a voltage divider bias. Uh, very handy if we have a single power supply. So we will start with a nice AC source over here. All right. So this will be our VN. And then this is going to come in through a coupling capacitor, through a couple of voltage divider resistors. We'll just call the one on top R1, R2 on the bottom. Here's our transistor. And we have a collector resistor up here, RC. Power supply VCC. Off of this we have a coupling capacitor which will go to our load, the thing that we are driving. And then I'm going to do something a little bit different down here in the emitter. Uh, normally on a biasing circuit we would just have one resistor going to ground here, but I'm going to split that in two. I'm going to have two resistors here. And the top one I'm just going to call RE1. And the bottom one I'm going to call RE2. How inventive. And in between these two, we are going to place a capacitor, a bypass capacitor. Okay. Now for DC, these caps all open up. Okay. Basically the source, AC source disappears. The load disappears, right, because these things are open. And then because this coupling cap opens up, essentially the DC emitter resistance is just the sum of these two pieces. Okay, now why we're going to split them will be apparent soon enough. All right, so your biasing on this would be a standard sort of um, approach. If this was a lightly loaded base, in other words, if the base current was a lot smaller than the divider current, we could assume uh, unloaded, ideally unloaded divider, and we could just use the voltage divider rule. R2 over R1 plus R2 times the power supply, that would get us the, the uh, base voltage, DC base voltage. Subtract off your 7 tenths on the base emitter. And what's left is, of course, going to drop across the combined emitter resistance, this capital RE over here. That will establish our emitter current. Now, we need the emitter current because for the transistor model, you might recall, the internal value of dynamic emitter resistance is a function of emitter current, the DC current. Right? Our model looks something like this. Right? Collector, base, emitter. So this is the R prime E, and we have an AC collector current of beta times IB. Right? R prime E, very important, this is a function of the design of the transistor, is 26 millivolts. We take that as a constant at room temperature. Right? It is a function of temperature. 26 millivolts at uh, room temperature divided by IE, and that will get us the value of R prime E. Okay? All right, now, having done our, our DC analysis and having obtained R prime E, what we would like to do is turn over to an AC equivalent circuit. All right? So now for the AC, what we're going to do is we are going to short out these capacitors. Right? Now in, their capacitive reactance is going to be small enough so that we can just call them shorts. In other words, by small we mean relatively small compared to the surrounding resistor values. All right? We're not saying they're literally zero, but they're small enough that we can call them or approximate them as shorts. Now, effectively, we're doing superposition here. So, considering the AC source, remember when you do superposition, all other sources 
are replaced with their ideal internal impedance. The source that we have here, of course, is the power supply. So we replace that with its ideal internal impedance, which would be a short, because it's a voltage source. So this point basically goes to AC ground. All right. Now we're going to redraw this. So here is our AC source. All right, that's our VN. Then we see these two resistors, R1 and R2. All right. R2 obviously going straight to ground. R1 going to ground because of the shorted power supply. Obviously, we can put those two things in parallel, right? Before you continue. We'll just call that maybe RB or something like that for base resistance, base bias re resistance. Now we come into the transistor and we're going to replace the device with our AC model. Right? So here's the R prime E value. There's the emitter. Now we had the short here, so this point is AC ground. So we see the RE1 going to ground. All right, so we refer to that, RE1, the AC case for RE, in other words the little RE, is just equal to big RE1. Okay, so this is our RE over here. And then coming off the collector we have our current source. All right, so that is beta times IB. And then we see RC, the biasing resistor, going again to the AC ground from the power supply. And finally, the output cap is shorted. And we have our load resistance, RL. Okay? All right. So the three things we were interested in, again, uh, the output impedance, the input impedance, and the amplification factor. I'm going to grab the output impedance first because it's essentially the easiest one. So essentially we look back from the position of the load, right? B the load, look back in this way. What do you see? Well, we see this RC obviously. And that winds up being in parallel with the impedance looking in at this point, which is essentially the internal impedance of this current source. Well, ideally that's an open, right? Um, in reality, it's going to be a very large value, hundreds of K ohms, maybe mega ohms, all depending on the transistor. Um, but it's going to be a very large value. And for typical sort of uh, biasing resistors that we would use, it's large enough to ignore. So we can just say that Z out is whatever that biasing resistor is, and we're done with it. Okay? Beautiful. Okay, now, continuing along, as long as we're on the impedance part of it, let's take a look at the input impedance. Okay, so the input impedance is back here. In other words, what does the driving source see? Okay, well that is really two parts. You can see that we have this RB value, and that is going to be in parallel with whatever the impedance is looking into the base, All right, which we will call Z in base. All right, so Z in is this RB in parallel with Z in base. Now we have a new question to ask, what the heck is Z in base? All right, well, by definition, Z into the base would have to be the voltage at the base divided by uh, the current going into the base, right? VB over IB. Well, what is VB? Right, this, this is VB right here, base to ground. Well, you notice that that's the voltage across the, um, the uh, biasing resistor RE1, in other words, our little RE, and the R'E. All right, how do I describe that in terms of Ohm's law? It's that resistance times the current through it, which is IE. IE and IC, of course, are nearly the same size. Um, and I'm going to write this in terms of beta times IB. Why? Because then I'll be able to cancel out the IBs. So we will say then that VB is this potential, which is the current through it, IE, which is approximately equal to IC, which is equal to beta times IB, times that impedance, right? So that's beta times IB times the quantity R prime E plus RE. And that's divided by IB. So those IBs cancel out. 
and we see that z in base is just equal to beta times the resistance that's sitting in the emitter, right? R prime e plus R e. All right, if we didn't have this split, in other words, if we just had the one resistor here, and the cap just went up right to the emitter, then R e would be zero, right? This, this would be sort of a special case, you could think of it, um, where R e is zero. Your z in base would be smaller, right? Typical values, R e is going to be a lot bigger than R prime e, so it tends to dominate in usual circuits, um, and that tends to increase your z in base, which of course back here would then increase your z in. Um, high in input impedances uh, for general purpose amplifiers, like audio amplifiers, is uh, generally a good thing, because that means you're not drawing a lot of current from the uh, driving source. All right? All right, that's two down, one to go. That's the voltage gain, the amplification factor, AV. Well, that's essentially your output voltage divided by your input voltage. Now, there's two ways we can go about this. We can look at what's called unloaded gain, and we can look at loaded gain. So unloaded gain is the maximum gain that you can get. Okay? Unloaded literally means without load. Okay? So loaded AV, no load. Okay? So we just unhook it. It's gone. It's history. Right? Think of it as infinity. This is the maximum gain you can ever hope to get out of here. All right? In the loaded case, you know, we do add on an RL, and that will decrease uh, the total impedance seen out here. What I need to consider is the value for little RL, which we sometimes refer to as little RC, the AC values. Either way you do it, it's big RC in parallel with RL. Okay, you can see those are just directly in parallel. Essentially what we're going to do is the same computation, um, either with just the big RC, in other words unloaded, or with the parallel combino, uh, combination. Okay, so let's just look at the unloaded gain first. What is my output voltage? Well, it's the voltage across this RC, right? Again, we're pretending that's gone. How do I write that in terms of Ohm's law? Well, it's this resistance times the current through it. What is the current through it? Well, it's controlled by this current source. So that current's coming up like this. And that produces a polarity on here of plus to minus bottom to top. So your output point is negative with respect to ground. So this is going below ground. And this would be the case for a positive input polarity. Right? What does this mean? Well, that means that if your input polarity as a normal sine wave like this, right? Then your output polarity would be going like this. It's flipped upside down. Now, in many cases, that doesn't make any difference. If you, for example, uh, flip the phase, you flip the uh, signal coming out of, um, you know, something simple like a walkie-talkie, uh, an intercom, whatever, um, table radio, uh, you really wouldn't be able to hear the difference. Okay. In some a a applications, it makes a big difference. You have to maintain um, correct phase. But, be that as it may, we simply would know that the output is negative. So I'll just say, well, that's a negative RC times the current. All right? So that's just IC times RC. How do I write my input voltage? Well, we've actually already done that, looking at the input impedance. So the input voltage is this VB again, okay, um, which we know is beta IB, or IC, times the R prime E plus R E. Once again, those currents can cancel out and we wind up with a negative R C over R prime E plus R E. So as long as that resistor is considerably larger than these resistors, we'll get a much bigger output voltage than we have as an input voltage. All right? Wonderful. For the loaded gain, the only difference is the value that you're going to use for your load, right? It's going to be little RC or little RL, whichever you prefer, instead of uh, the biasing resistor RC. 
Now the question might be, well, why do I calculate both of these things? Well, you know, if I just had the one load, right, I got a fixed load out here, we would probably just calculate the loaded gain and be done with it. Um, on the other hand, if we're um, changing what the load is, then it actually makes sense for us to figure out the unloaded gain, and then we can figure out what the effect is of the load separately. The way we would do that would be through a little voltage divider. Because what we're really saying here is, look, there's an output impedance of RC, and we're gonna, we can model this, just, even though this is a current source, we can still model this as a voltage source, um, just, just for visualization, right? Because, you know, we can't do a source conversion. But basically what we're saying is this is a controlled source, right? When we convert this, this is a controlled source that's equal to A times whatever my VN is. And there's an output impedance that's equal in this case to RC. And this hooks up to my load. Right? This being the unloaded gain. So here's an example. All right? Use some easy numbers. Um, suppose that your RC is 10K ohms. All right? And that's also the value of your RL. Further, let's say the R prime E plus R E works out to a total of 1K ohms. All right? Now, if you calculate your unloaded gain, that's going to be 10K over 1K for an inverting gain of 10. All right? Now, when you throw the uh, actual load on here, right, the 10K load, then you'd actually have 10K in parallel with 10K, which is, uh, of course, 5K. So you'd have 5K divided by 1K. You've got a gain of 5 now, all right? Well, you could do it this way. You say, well, I've got an unloaded gain of 10, and then I have a voltage divider between my RC and my RL. So what is this voltage divider? All right, well, it's the thing you're interested in, RL over the total RC plus RL. Well, if RC and RL are the same size, all right, if they're both 10K, then this is going to be 0.5. So you have a loaded gain of 0.5 times the unloaded gain of 10, 5, which is what we calculated with the loaded gain. So basically, if you have a situation where this load is fixed, it's just going to be easier for you to figure out the loaded gain. If this is not a fixed value, if you're going to hook this up to different things, right, different sorts of loads, then it might make more sense to figure out what the unloaded gain is, and then you could do this little voltage divider effect to figure out what it is for any particular load impedance, right? You just have to do a little voltage divider effect. Now, the same thing can happen at the front end. Now, I'm not drawing it here, but your source could have an internal impedance associated with it, all right? Now, that would appear over here. Now, in lab, if you use a function generator, that's 50 ohms. And for typical sorts of circuits that we would work with, it's small enough to ignore. But in fact, just like there is here, there is a possibility of a voltage divider effect. So here's my input voltage. All right. Here's the source impedance associated with that. I'll call it RS. We'll assume it's purely resistive. And then here's your Zn. Okay. Now, if Zn is a lot bigger than RS, virtually all of Vn gets to the input of the transistor. In other words, it actually gets to the base of the transistor. See, back here, because we don't have that, we're assuming it's small enough to ignore, then the applied voltage is the base voltage. It's the same thing. But if this internal impedance is pretty large, that's not going to be the case. And there are instances where this number can be pretty big. For example, a, uh, uh, an electric guitar pickup. This could be several K ohms. And if you have a Zn that's just a few K ohms, you know, there's a sizable signal mismatch there. You could lose a considerable amount of signal, right? So that little loss, that sort of impedance match or source loss, whatever you want to call it, is nothing more than a voltage divider. So the thing you're interested in, Zn divided by that source impedance plus the Zn, will tell you what that fraction of, Z, of Vn gets to the input, right? So if we calculated the unloaded gain and we have a large source impedance, then we would take our input voltage, we'd multiply it by this little uh, divider here, 
to figure out how much actually gets to the base. You take that, you multiply it by your unloaded gain, and that would be the biggest possible voltage you could ever get out here if you didn't have an RL, if this was open. Right? If we do have an RL, that voltage would then be split down in accordance with this voltage divider. Right? Or as I said, if it's fixed, we could just figure out what the loaded gain is and go from there. All right? So if we come up with a gain of you know, 100, I'm going to have maybe 1 millivolt coming in here. If we can ignore the source impedance, then that 1 millivolt is going to get multiplied by a gain of 100. We're going to see 100 millivolts out there, but it is going to be flipped. Right? We do have this inversion okay, on the signal. So when the input goes positive, this output's going negative. All right? Okay, we're good.